on the right, you have Barry Smith. Barry is on the draws by virtue of being the seventh seed here. So he's going to be facing, going to have to break serve at least once, either taking this game one or a possible game three if he doesn't take it. Well, what's working in Barry's favor is he has one of the best cards in the format for breaking serve against White Red Aggro, and that's Golgari Charm. Yeah, two of in the main deck. So with that, we are underway. Dustin Grover is going to go ahead and start out by shocking into a Soldier of the Pantheon. So having one of his best turn one plays. We'll see just how good his start is here. And Barry, this, as is a lot of with the Jun decks, uh, you know, turn one Temple really, really their best play. He doesn't even he doesn't have access to Elvish Mystic, so this this is his turn one. Mm -hmm. And this is the risk for Barry here. When he's on the draw, he has nothing to do on turn one, and not a lot to do on turn two. Even if his hand is good after that point, you know, he's got some cards like Corsair Crucifix, Chandra Pyromaster that caused some headaches for Dustin, but he might just get too far behind if Dustin's start is really explosive. Yeah, scries to the top. When I think about these removal-heavy control decks in standard, whether they're, they're not, whether they're pure control or a mid-range deck, um, to me, one of the things is, that seems like a defining thing about them is that there's no one mana removal spell in the format. You know, in past formats, you've had things like Tragic Slip or Lightning Bolt or something like that. I mean, unless you want to go ahead and go for Shock, there doesn't seem to be much you can play at one. And even if there were one mana removal spells, it would have, it would cause the deck to significantly change its mana base because it plays so many comes to play tap lands. Yeah. I think the, the John Walker's deck overall is much happier playing a bunch of Scry lands and starting on turn two. But this is one of the matchups where yeah, you're paying a cost for building your deck that way. All right, so we see a swing for two from Gorud, another shock, and he's going to go ahead and empty out the hand. We have Dryad Militant and Judge's Familiar joining Soldier of the Pantheon here. Not uh, bad to have Judge's yeah. Familiar here. It does give some protection against Golgari Charm at least the next turn. Yeah, looking at Gorud's hand, we'll see whether or not he was able to find a copy of that spell. So he'd have to cast it on three mana, which means he'd actually still be taking quite a few points of damage before he was able to resolve one. But depending on Dustin's leftovers, even a turn three Golgari Charm here may be enough to just win the game. Right. Uh, Dustin's protection spells, as you meant, uh, you know, if you know this deck, are cards like Boros Charm and Brave the Elements, all of which do not protect him from Golgari Charm. Yeah, my experience playing decks like White, White Red Aggro, Golgari Charm is among the worst cards in the format you can play against. Instant speed, two mana, and incredibly powerful at every stage of the game. Well, he's going to get some help here. That's Sylvan Caryatid as his play for the turn. So that will wall up against one of these 2-1 ground pounders, but he's still looking to take three this turn. And something that's working in Dustin's favor for the matchup here, no copies of Pelucranos anywhere in Barry's list. That's the uh, the best card that Jun-type strategies have against a deck like a Boros beatdown deck. And Barry's Xenagos much less powerful here. Now, Barry actually looking like he's, gonna, he's tanking on the block here. It seems like he's a little short on mana right now. He's not sure he wants to risk that caryatid to any sort of trick that Dustin could have. The only trick in the deck here that could potentially ruin Barry with a block here is Boros Charm, giving the creature double strike. And can you really afford to take four, five damage in, against a deck with Boros Charm? The other thing here, as, per, as Barry identifies, is he can just block the Soldier of the Pantheon because Boros Charm cannot target Soldier of the Pantheon to give a double strike. So that's a safe block. He does take three and no play from Grorud. So now, now we'll Barry getting to untap with his mana. We'll get to see what kind of removal spell he has and will it be enough to stabilize him here? He, he didn't take too much damage last turn. No, he's in, he's in good shape here. Now, Dustin's got a couple uh, sources of closeout, which is Boros Charm and Brave the Elements. He also has two copies of Ajani Steadfast. So even if he's flooding out a little bit, he has a couple cards here to help catch him up. All right. Un no plays there from Barry either. He makes a Temple of Malady into play. Yeah, we're looking at Grover's hand. He has at least one more land in Mana Confluence. I believe two more. One of them is a Muta Vault, so that's actually not terrible for him. He's going to repeat last turn's attack, see if he can sneak across three more damage, or whether one of them will, will snag a removal spell out of Barry's hand. And I imagine we're going to see at the, the same block as last turn. Solon carries it on... Soldier of the Pantheon is always a safe block. And this is actually before blocks. He's going to go ahead and use that to cast a Golgari Charm, tapping the Karyatid so that he doesn't have to use a Pain Man uh, off Lanwar Wastes there. As you mentioned, this is one of the best cards here. Dustin's going to force him to pay an additional one with Judge's Familiar, but that's about it. It's going to get the entire team. And this is 
this card, like I said, it's just hard for Dustin to beat. That's, that's just all there is to it. Yeah, you see in his hand there was a Brave the Element sneaking in there. Um, normally his anti-sweeper insurance policy, but something that doesn't really work here. And the thing is, most of the time when you're playing against the card Golgar charm, it's at least not game one. It's pretty rare for your opponent to have in the, in the first game. Right, and Barry has multiple Golgari charms in his main deck. Yeah. Interestingly enough, to make room for them, he has moved all four Storm Breath Dragons that you'd expect in the strategy to the sideboard. Which makes a lot of sense to me. You, you know, game one, you're going to be playing against so many copies of cards like Doomblade and Ultimate Price and so forth that, uh, you know, having one big juicy target in your deck for your opponent's spot removal does not make a lot of sense. Yeah, especially when you have, what is it, um, 10 Planeswalkers? I, I am, you know, I am not too sad to not be playing Storm Breath Dragon. I think more interestingly, he's playing four Thoughtseize out of the board, too. Mm -hmm. So he's got a lot of these cards you'd really expect in the strategy um, in the sideboard. We do see now Barry go on the offensive. He makes Xenagos the Reveler here. Xenagos brings a Seder token into play. Game one, Barry's trying to capitalize on a lot of, you know, dead card advantage. The opponents are going to have a lot of cards in their main deck that just don't, do not line up with the type of thing that Barry's doing. Right, we see this Brave the Elements, for example, in Groru's hand, and yep. it's... It is not helping at all. No. Not even close to being within striking distance of Boros Charm, either. Yeah. Um, so we go back to Barry. He's playing pretty conservatively. Made a Seder last turn. Left it on defense, I think, perhaps just to play around cards like Raise the Alarm. Well, there's also a Mutavault up on Dustin's side of the table, and I think Barry knows that if the game stays at this pace, he cannot lose. He can only lose by getting too aggressive, so... Right. Better to err on the side of caution. Yeah, he waits to swing until he can swing with two satyrs, and he's going to go ahead and do that this turn. And it looks like Barry also has a copy of Chandra Pyromaster in his hand, and that's the other card in his deck that's uh, just a real struggle for Dustin to slog through. If Dustin's draw is really explosive or he has one of his crusade effects, then Chandra may not matter very much, but when you get to this position, so many of Dustin's draws are one top his creatures. It's yeah. just hard to beat. Looking at his main deck, he does have Judge of Familiar, Imposing Sovereign, Daring Skyjack, Soldier of the Pantheon, Dryad Militant, and Boros Elite. So that's about 20 creatures that die to a Chandra. And Chandra has a lot of volatility in the matchup because if Dustin has one of his Crusade effects, Chandra does close to nothing. Yeah, Spear of Heliod and Hall of Triumph pretty much neutralize the card. But if Dustin is without one of those cards, it is Vasara plus other powers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, is. It'll, it will just take something down every turn. Not to mention it's zero ability. All right, so first up, update we have here. Um, in a one versus eight matchup, Sean Wyhe uh, looking to possibly get his second open with Mono Black. He actually takes game one off our one seed on, off a of black-white midrange player. Pretty surprising, but... Knowing your deck can never be underrated, I would say. When you have four pack rats, a lot of times the other 56 cards don't matter in yeah. a given game. <laughs> I was talking to him about the matchup, and he said, oh, no, it's not good, but, you know, so he said, well, I can still just mono-black him, you know? He's <laughs> just playing mono-black. <laughs> yeah, I feel like in that matchup, the, the where black-white gets the advantage is you have a lot of games where, like, the, the game breaks down really early, both players, but the ones where both players kind of get to get their card draw engines going. I think that's where black-white midrange really shines, because, you know, they'll they will draw cards like Revoke Existence, uh, Banishing Light, or actually ways to deal with, you know, to knock the other guy's Underworld connections off the table. Yeah, they're not just solely playing off the top of their deck. They right. have some amount of play. Whereas the black, you know, once once you resolve connections against mono black, like, that connection is there for the whole game. Yep. Back to the game at hand here, we see a, re looks like a replacement Xenagos for the first Xenagos here. First one got Boros Charmed by Grorud. Bear was able to get another one down. And the beats continue here. It looks like it's going to be about this turn, and I think one more turn, and that should be enough for Barry to take the first game. Yeah. Barry has one Planeswalker in play that kills most of Dustin's draws, and Barry has a Planeswalker in play that generates a token that is better than most of Dustin's draws. So this is a tough spot to be in. So was this game, can we say this game just came down to Golgari Charm? It, it seemed like Dustin's draw was a little on the weaker side as well. You know, he only had f ever drew five power worth of creatures. Yeah, Dustin's draw was not great, but I still feel like without Golgari Charm, he's got a shot in this game. The Brave the Elements is an effective tool against a person who's trying to turtle up with a bunch of Seder tokens. So that Brave the Elements that's stranded in Dustin's hand right now, 
could have been good had the game broke differently. Yeah, Daring Skyjack is a play for Dustin, but with only four life, he's not going to have a way just around fourth Seder attack, not to mention the fact that Chandra will probably gun down this Skyjack. And Barry has, I think, five cards to hand right now. Yeah, he's gonna, Dustin's going to brave in response to the Chandra. He'll brave for red, I would think. But I still believe he's dead on this turn. As long as Barry makes, makes the techie play of turning everything sideways, which I have to imagine he'll do. Yeah, Chandra's going to plus one and one. Brave the elements. We'll save during Skyjack. No damage to... Um, actually, he still takes the damage. It's like... So there's two targets. It's a double targeting effect. And abrupt decay. That'll be good enough. Game one goes to Barry Smith. Not a lot to be done there. Dustin's draw not very good. Uh, and Barry with both of his aces in the matchup. Golgari Charm and Chandra Pyromaster. Yeah, so game one, we'll go ahead and look at the players' sideboards. But before we do, we're going to bring you back into the booth. Uh, this is going to be a day full of giveaways as we have our full top eight in the morning and our full legacy top eight in the evening. For those of you joining us, we give away free Star City Games Premium. That's a subscription to the premium content on StarCityGames.com during our top eight matches. So depending on what round we're in, you get increasing amounts of Star City Games Premium. So three, six, and 12 months. First giveaway will be for three. And how you play is make sure you have an active Twitter account or just a Twitter account, and if you, we're going to ask you a question. If you believe you know the answer, you send out a tweet with the correct answer on it and put on it hashtag SEG Premium. You see that on the bottom of your screen. Make sure you're following us on SEG Live, and at the end of the top eight matches, we will announce a winner of three, game, three months of Star City Games Premium. So with that in hand, you have a question for us, I believe. Yeah, we've been giving, uh, we've been showing a lot of information over this show and the last couple shows about Grand Prix Orlando, which Star City Games is running this October. We're very excited about it. And so our questions this weekend are going to be pertaining to that event. The question we have is, what is the format for Grand Prix Orlando? All right. Do you know about Grand Prix Orlando? That's coming up in a, couple, in a little over a month. If you believe you know the answer to that, tweet that, send out that tweet, and we will pick the winner at the end of the round. Again, tweet at SCG Live, hashtag SCG Premium. And of the correct responders, one will be selected at random. All right, with that, let's go ahead and go into our sideboarding here. We have, well, let's go to the, the player who's going to have to go uphill a little bit here. Dustin Grorud, he said he has a good matchup here, but he's going to be, you know, he's down a game, so now he's going to have to make some adjustments. I would have to assume, as with most matchups against Jund decks, like, that this matchup gets tougher after sideboard. Yeah, he's got a Gideon, Champion of Justice, uh, two Celestial Players, Three Candy Keating Apparition, two Museum Mortar, two Last Breath, two Fiend Slayer Paladin, two Fraction Revoker, one Boros Charm. There's not a lot here that lines up with anything that Barry is really doing. If he believes that he can't really deal 20 points of damage with creatures, which is a reasonable assumption, then maybe he wants to bring in the fourth Boros Charm. I think the two copies of Museum Mortars here are reasonable as well because Barry does have Corsair Crucifix in his deck, and it's reasonable to assume that he's sideboarding in Stormbreath Dragon as well. So Mortars can be good here, but. There's a, there's not a lot. I mean, none of these cards are very much against Planeswalkers. He can bring in Phyrexian Revoker, but it's another thing that gets swept away by Golgari Charm. It's another thing that gets shot down by Chandra. And so even though that card can be good sometimes against Planeswalkers, I don't even know if Dustin can afford to bring in a two-mana one-toughness creature. You know, how do you feel about a card like Fiend Slayer Paladin? Barry is a deck with red and black remo spot removal and quite a bit of it, so it would, on, at a first glance, seem good. But then when you look at it again, it's a 2-2 two, two for three, so it's not, it's not as fast as some of your other creatures. You know, like, do you want to sacrifice speed for resiliency here? No chance. I think his own, he can't beat Barry going long, and Barry's got a bunch of good blockers for Fiend Slayer Paladin. He has Corsair Crucifix and Sylvan Carried it as well. So uh, even if he's able to, you know, jam Barry's removal up a little bit, he's not going to be able to stop him from blocking. So I think your best bet is just to be as streamlined and aggressive as possible and hope that Barry doesn't have Golgari Charm or some other sweeper uh, because I don't think you can, you can beat him card per card. All right, over on Barry's side, it's a little different than you'd expect out of a Jund mid-range sideboard. Normally those have lots of ones and twos to kind of side out the bad cards, side in the good cards for a matchup. Barry's done something interesting, which I kind of alluded to earlier, where he has full places of Stormbreath Dragon and Thoughtseize in his sideboard, cards that are typically main decked in this kind of strategy, so he can do large shifts to it, to his deck if he needs to. Um, I would have to think in this matchup that, you know, that it's just kill things, kill things, kill things. He's going to board in two more Devour Fleshes, board in a Golgari Charm. Putrefy even seems fine. Um, so at least I think that those four would come in. 
On top of that, rather than finishing the game with a Planeswalker, I'm wondering whether he'd prefer to finish a game with a Stormbreath Dragon, as it is pro-white against a pretty much white deck. I think Stormbreath Dragon is a good route for Barry to go to here, because he has a lot of Planeswalkers who are just not that efficient. Cards like Garrick and Vraska, Liliana, I think he's going to want to get away from those kind of cards. They're slow, they're cumbersome, they don't have a huge impact on the board the turn they play him, except for Garrick, which is a lot of mana. I think with Stormbreath Dragon, uh, he's much better served just trying to win the game that way. It's a much more effective blocker, so. Yeah, there's a fair amount of dead weight in his main deck in this matchup. Seeing cards like uh, three Read the Bones, two Rakdos's Return. Like, does he, I don't feel like he has time to do any of these things. Well, I don't mind Read the Bones here as long as he has a lot of cheap removal because, you know, he can stabilize the board and then Read the Bones is fine there. I think Rakdos Returns and the more expensive Planeswalkers are really easy cuts. Yeah, so he actually is going to become a pretty much you know, post-board, he could have, if, if you want to look at spot removal, um, three Mizium Mortars, three Golgari Charms, three Abrupt Decays, um, a Dreadbore, two Putrefies, on top of two Devour Flesh, that's 14 pinpoint kill spells. That seems like qu it's quite a lot. And yep. The half match is going to be pretty effective. I don't know if Barry is going to want Devour Flesh on the draw. I think on the play, it's totally reasonable. Uh, and it still might be better than some of his more cumbersome cards. Uh, whether he's on the play or the draw, but it's not the most efficient answer against a deck that has so many cheap, you know, can the, flood the board with so many one mana permanents. Yeah, Devour Flesh against a deck that's playing Raise the Alarm is, can't, you know, has the potential to be a pretty weak card. And Precinct Captain as well. There's a couple ways for Devour Flesh to go wrong. All right, well, game two underway. Dustin is going to be on the play for a second time. And we will see if he can dodge Golgari Charm at the very least. All right, so the winner of this match is what we kind of deemed as the quintessential match of standard in Will Urker versus Feline Longmore. Feline nabs her first top eight ever in standard, but her trip ends there as Will takes the match two games to zero. So the winner of this will be facing against Mono Blue Devotion, which I'd have to think if I'm Will Urker, I'm pretty excited to see a John Walker's player up already here. Yeah, that matchup's got to be good for Mono Blue. Pretty surprising result there in our 3-6 match for that to be over not only for uh, Feline to lose but to lose that quickly. Yeah we did get a chance to see Will Urker. Remember he went 8-0 with the deck yesterday. He is quite the pilot of the deck. He definitely showed he showed some expertise while playing it in the round. I wouldn't be surprised if he just knows his deck well enough. But uh, back to our side, Justin has a, you know, this reminds me of back in the, back old White Weenie where it's Savannah Lions into two more Savannah Lions. Granted, these Savannah Lions are a lot better than Savannah Lions have been in the past. He has two Soldiers of the Pantheons and a Dryad Militant. So they all get abilities this time. Um, but this is a draw that has foiled many a player over the years. Now, this is a very a draw that's very soft to Golgari Charm. Right, I was going to say, <laughs> if there's a Golgari Charm, <laughs> however... Right. And this is the way that Dennis Dustin, I believe, has to play the matchup here. He, you know, yeah. he can't slow roll his threats because Barry has so many pinpoint removal spells. If he tries to pace the game slowly, Barry can just pick him apart piece by piece. So he's got to play like this and just hope for the best. I mean, you always played your three Savannah lines into Pyroclasm, right? You just don't. I mean, it depends. You can't well. play around it. Certainly against a deck that has 20 Pyroclasms, you kind of don't have a choice but to hope for the best here. Yeah, and if you're Dustin, he's got to be really thrilled here that Barry's turn two play was Mortars a Soldier go. Yeah, means Dustin's still got a good shot. And more importantly, means Barry doesn't have a Golgari Charm or something like that. But yeah, Dustin's got to be thrilled with how this game is starting. Even All though right. turn two removal spell is not ideal for him. It's still better than the alternative. Okay, we are going to... So he continues. This is going to be Bramaz, King of Oreskos. He comes down on turn three, hits in for four, Barry's down to 14. Bramaz kind of has this flag bearer in it that Barry, I would think, has to answer it immediately if possible. And he may not necessarily be able to answer it straight away. Yeah, he, we do see Mizium Mortars in the yard. That's one of his possible answers to it. He does... I, it does seem like a lot of his removal is fine. You know, he has Dreadbore, Abrupt Decay, Mortars, Putrefy. So his removal can answer it. So you see Mizium Mortars does. He does have one. He takes out the Bramaz. Well, the problem is he's still taking four damage every turn here. He yeah. doesn't have a stabilizing force. And now the game's kind of getting in this place where even something like, you know, Boros Charm may be good. Yeah, I'm actually really excited if the, the card in Dustin's hand, he has an Imposing Sovereign. Because, you know, some of the ways that these Jun decks might stabilize is say he plays 
Xenagos, right? And then starts making satyrs to block or something like that. That's how I would see Barry stabilizing here, but Imposing Sovereign just makes all that take one more turn, and I'm not sure that's a turn that Barry has. Yep. Imposing Sovereign is the play. One mana up for Gorud, and he does have Brave the Elements in hand. So I like the sequencing a lot from Dustin here. He had the option of playing the Phyrexian Revoker and naming Chandra. Sequencing it this way means that if Barry plays Phyrexian uh, Chandra and shoots something, Dustin can use Brave the Elements, untap, and then Revoker it. He ha if he uses Revoker preemptively, then something like Xenagos could create a problem. So Dustin advancing his board in the best way possible and has the Revoker back in his hand for more information depending on what Barry does. Yeah, so say, for example, Barry had both of them in his hand. This would bait him into playing the, you know, and he revokes the Chandra previous, like, before doing it, then Barry's like, oh, I'll play the other one. But this time he can actually get Barry to, like, play the wrong card. Right. And use up an entire turn in the process. Yeah. Other updates on the bracket. Matt Tierney with John Monsters takes game one over Scott Lipp. And actually, a correction to our earlier one, the match between Nick Marriott and Sean Wyhe. Nick Marriott, the one seed, is the, is the winner of game one. So mm -hmm. Black White Midrange did take game one over Mono Black. Uh, Sean down in a hole now. And you can see kind of why I like the matchup in the abstract for Dustin, setting aside the pinging effects. There's been nothing wrong with Barry's draw so far. And you feel like Dustin's got a really good shot at winning this yeah, game. Yeah, turn two kill spell, turn three kill spell. That's, that's pretty good for yeah. Barry. It, it, does fe it did feel like this game that the whole time you're thinking, man, Barry, Barry's kind of on go guard time or bust. I have, you know, has, I have felt that way. Corsair of Crufix is Barry's play. He's going to come into play tap from Imposing Sovereign. He gets to play land, taking himself up to 10. Top card of deck revealed. And if right now, Guru is going to be able to put him down to four. If he can draw a Boros Charm, he can actually just get the game this turn. And we may see a preemptive Revoker now, because Dustin has close to lethal in play. Yeah, we see Raise the Alarm was the draw for a turn, which actually when you get your opponent down to four, having an instant speed to anything is pretty powerful. I think with Raise the Alarm in hand, now Dustin is simply going to pass the turn, because he beats, you know, something like Chandra or another, you know, the Imposing yeah. Sovereign has a blocker beat, the Brave the Elements beats a removal spell, so on and so forth. Knox Barry down to four, and you're right, it, it seems like it's going to be difficult for Barry not to be dead on the next turn. You see actually cards in his hand, like Liliana Vest is actually hanging out there for game two, and I, I think it's one of the things you alluded to, you said there sure is, are a lot of cuttable things, you know, Vraska and Liliana both in his hand. I don't, these cards seem like they are never going to matter in this matchup. Very. You know, maybe he'll play differently because he doesn't know Dustin's hand, but based on the hand, I think the play he actually needs to do is read the bones, hoping to find land Golgari Charm. I do not think he has a way to win the game besides that. Yeah, and actually, because of Raise the Alarm, I don't know, okay, no, he still has a shot. All right, read the, he's going to make the play. All right, he's, he's on it, I think. Yep, Hero's Downfall, and Sylvan Karyatid. He's going to... I mean, if you're, if you're right, he's going to have to bottom both of these cards. Yeah, those, those provide no help. All right, we'll see. Does he get the draw? First draw is land. All right, can he do it? And land. And another read the bones on top. Well, that one's certainly not castable. Barry drops to two off the read the bones. And I don't believe he has. Yeah, without a go guard time, we're going to be on to game three here. Yeah, it'll actually look like he has, still has, his hand is Liliana, Vraska, and Garrick Apex Predator. So he has left in the entire Planeswalker package. Yeah, and I, I would have gotten away from these cards in a major way if I was Barry. Well, I don't know if you can really play a seven mana Planeswalker against White Weenie. I don't, that's, that's just I mean, way too much mana. Maybe Vraska is tolerable because it's still a removal spell at the end right, of the day. I, I like, I agree. I, I'm not, I'm not saying you have to board them all. Vraska, you, you can make a case for. But I think Liliana is... Not a card you get, you know, it's a lot of these cards, you know, Garrick and Liliana will be fine in games where you're already a favorite to win the game. You know, if you can afford to take a turn off to, you know, uh, tutor for a Golgari charm or some other sweeper like Vizium Mortars, that's one thing. But that's only likely to happen in games where Barry is already in front. So I'm curious how he made room for things. Unless he just didn't bring in the Stormbreath Dragons, which I guess is possible. But Stormbreath just strikes me as a much better tool in the matchup than some of these more cumbersome Planeswalkers. It does look like Barry's going back to the sideboard here, so we will see. I mean, if he was on the fence about some of these cards staying in, what his hand looked like at the end of that game, I'm sure, is an incentive for him to switch things up a bit. 
Yeah, and it looks like he is, if you look at it, he's definitely going back to the sideboard right now. So updates from across the bracket. We have a bunch of quick finishes in our top eight. Nick Marriott, the one seed, defeats Sean Wyhe two games to zero. So he's moving to the top four with his black-white mid-range deck. He'll be facing Matt Tierney, who's playing Jund Monsters. So in what you deemed is a little bit of an upset, the uh, Jund Matt Tierney was able to defeat Scott Lips green-white aggro two games to zero. So we have Jund, black-white, and mono-blue all in the top four right now. Kind of a, a combination of some of the usual suspects, I would say. Yeah. As, as usual, you know, the joy slowly sucked out as the established best <laughs> decks stomp on the people trying to do something different. Hell. But we still have these two competitors, both of whom are kind of doing their own thing. I mean, we've seen variations of these strategies over the last couple of months, but they are definitely not one of the five most popular decks in the room. And I'm a big fan of the, I've always been a big fan of the White Weenie deck. I've played it a fair bit. And, uh, you know, Battlefield Forge does improve this deck quite a bit. Yeah, well, that's one of the decks we act, we really had week one of New Standard, way back when Theros Block first came out. This was one of, this is, I think, is one of the real good decks we saw the first weekend. Now, it has gotten better. You know, it has cards like Raise the Alarm have since been added to it. But the basic shell has been around for a while, and, and it's been pretty good. Yep. Uh, ben Lundquist won the Los Angeles Open uh, with this strategy. Uh, he and I played a fair bit of it online, played it at Grand Prix Albuquerque together. Uh, I'm a big fan of this deck. It does have different strengths and weaknesses from the other decks, but the, the biggest weakness that the deck had was just mana. You just couldn't cast your spells a good percentage of games. Or you had these Temple of Triumphs and your draws were not smooth, and that's all been corrected now. You can play Sacred Foundry, you can play Battlefield Forge, you know, Dustin's mana base, for example, he's got one temple and a mana confluence that, you know, 10 red sources, pretty reliable. He's not paying a huge cost here to get that into his deck. And it makes Boros Charm and other cyborg cards much more reliable. Two yeah. Mizium Mortars, which I like a lot, that, that I think mm -hmm. is the right number of that that you want to have. I would like to have a Burning Earth on the sideboard. That's a huge trunk. Yeah, and I think some plays have gotten away from that as a lot of the control decks, like Blue White has gone to, have gone to playing a lot of basics. Um, so that's been a, you know, a deck you wouldn't want it as much against. But, you know, uh, yeah, against a deck like Jund Walker's Burning Earth would be a, this would be a great card in the matchup. Any, any tournament where I know Jeff Hoagland's showing up, I'm bringing at least one Burning Earth to my sideboard. Because <laughs> I know that's a, that's a free win if it ever shows up against Jeff. All right, so seven cards. We are about to be underway here. Barry's going to be on the play. He took game one, lost game two. And I still, having watched these games, just... It feels like the, the quite just the does he have Golgari charm game when I'm watching them. Well, on the play, it's different. I think Barry can win what I would call an honest game on the play. Just removal spell, removal spell, and get value with Planeswalkers. On the draw, you know, those aren't going to be Dustin's good hands. But Golgari charm is always the, the trump, almost no matter what. And it is a three of in Barry's deck, so especially after board. So after board, it's not unreasonable to think he would draw one. No, he's got, he's got a, quite a few copies. And Chandra is not a bad backup to that. The problem with Chandra is if Dustin gets Spear of Heliod or Hall Tramp into play, Chandra does nothing. That, right. That's the problem with that card. But it does play a similar role to Golgari Charm. All right, we are underway in game three here. This is our last quarterfinal match. It's between Justin Grorud and Barry Smith, starting with Temple of Abandon for Barry. And we'll see what kind of start Dustin has here. He does have an Anthem effect. He has a Spear of Heliod in his hand. This is the first game he's had one of those. So he does have a little bit of an insurance policy against cards like, like Chandra, as you mentioned. And even Golgari Charm, as long as Barry doesn't have it too soon. Yep. The, the issue is Golgari Charm still kills the Spear. So it's not a total trump, but it's right. better than his whole board getting swept away. Yeah, he's going to start out on Judge's Familiar. Had the option between Judge's Familiar and Boros Elite. Looking at his compilation of creatures here, he looks like he does have Daring Skyjack and Boros Elite, among others, in his hand. This is a game that's setting up pretty well for Spear of Heliod to be a big influence. Yeah. And Barry, no, no turn two to just immediately kill that Judge's Familiar. He's going to go with another Temple of Abandon. You see in his hand, he has Xenagos the Reveler, so he has something to build up toward. And it looks like he has a Stomping Ground as well, so he is set on lands to make it up to that point. Looks like Dustin has brought in Keating Apparition, which I think is fine. 
it's something that doesn't get killed by a sweeper, and it does kill Corsair Crufix. So yeah. I think that Dustin probably sideboarded in such a way to get as many of his low-value one toughness creatures out of the deck, knowing how many sweepers he's playing against. Yeah, Judge's Familiar gets first damage in on Barry. He's down to 19. Dustin played a Scryland, and then we'll have Boros Elite join. And I like this because if he's getting Golgari Charmed right now, he's not losing his highest-value creatures. Yeah, of, of course he doesn't want to play against Golgari Charm here, but it's not the end of the world. Life will go on for Dustin if, if that card shows up here. Yeah, as long as he's aware, you know, he, he has to make him play a little bit differently, but as long as he's aware of it, he should be okay. Yeah. Turn three here, Lanoir Wastes for Barry Smith. Looks like it's going to be a Courser of Crufix. Now this is, this is pretty solid here for Dustin. I mean, he has the Kinning Apparition in hand. Yeah, Chandra the top card here. So because of that Chandra on top, Justin may have to just play, if he can, just drop a Spear of Heliod. But I'm not convinced he has a third land. Well, I think that he, he can't allow the Courser to stay in play. I think he's just got to uh, suck up that this is not going to be good for him. He has a Revoker in hand, so he can lose a creature and then Revoker the Chandra and hope for the best. Or if he draws Spear, then he's uh, a land for Spear, then he's totally in the clear. But I don't think he can allow this Courser Crufix to stay in play. This doesn't look pretty, but I think this is Dustin's best line. And he agrees Keying Apparition will take out Course of Crufix, and in come the troops, but right now they're just a pair of 1-1s. One Barry takes two, he's at, but he's still at a very healthy 17 as he draws Chandra Pyromaster for the turn. No third land from Grorood, and Barry's going to be able to get Dustin down to just a single 1-1. One -one. And then the question will be, once Chandra's down and revoked, will... Dustin be able to power through the Xenagos that will almost certainly follow. It's a lot of problems, you know. It's, it, you know, these kind of games, there's a lot to slog through on Barry's side. Barry helps the cause. He's going to shock himself down to 15 because he has to for this Chandra. But he's going to get some pretty strong value out of it. And there we have it. Chandra comes down, pluses up to five. And which creature will he go for? I would guess. And yeah, it's Judge's Familiar. Dustin's down to 17. And the other issue with Chandra in this matchup is you're not killing five loyalty. That's that's too much. Yeah, you, you can't take the time to, to, to kill her, I wouldn't think. So he's just going to have to revoke it and hope that there's no kill spell. By making that play of Revoker on Chandra, you're really softening yourself up to any removal. I think his other line here is just cast Spear of Heliod. That, may be, that just may be better. I think that's the better play here. Now, yes, it's bad if he has Golgari Charm or Abrupt Decay, but your Phyrexian Revoker wasn't beating those cards anyway. So this has kind of the highest upside, I think. He's going to go ahead and revoke the Chandra here. And then swing for one. Barry's down to 14. And the third land isn't play for Dustin. He has, plays a Sacred Foundry tapped. So now we'll see. We know Xenagos said before his hang is in Barry's hand to start making blockers. Yeah, the, the reason I do not like this play very much from Dustin, I think, is because, you know, if he... Imagine Barry has exactly one removal spell. You cast Spear. He has to use the removal spell on your Spear. And then your Revoker is now locking Chandra. Playing it this way means that, you know, you're... Now what does your Spear do in this spot? Yeah, it doesn't. I mean, I said before that if you played Revoker, it was a very that line was very soft to a kill spell, and that's exactly what happened. Barry played a fifth land tapped. He putrefied the Revoker, which freed up his Chandra to kill the Boros Elite, and now Dustin doesn't have a board. Now, if you play the Spear, he has to abrupt decay the Spear or putrefy the Spear or what have you. Then you play the Revoker, and if that was his only removal spell, okay, well now your your head's above water. Right. Well, both ways he's going to lose his whole board, right? If he played, had he played the Spear, Barry could have just putrefied the Spear, and then Chandra killed the, the Boros Elite. So like. He was losing all his permanence both ways. Yeah, but in this world, he gets to have a Phyrexian Revoker in play naming Chandra. Instead of a Spear of Instead of a Spear of Heliod with no creatures in play. I, yeah, and I agree. Now, maybe Dustin's plan involves, like, I need the Spear because so many of my draws are dead, but I think I would have reversed the way that I ordered things. Yeah, and Barry starts to pull away here. With just a lone Spear on Dustin's side, he has an opportunity to make Course of Crufix, play a sixth land to gain a life. This is all before a Chandra activation. Chandra's going to go all the way up to seven. And we see on top of his deck, there's a Mizium Mortars. This is kind of a fun interaction, actually, between the Chandra and Corsair. You can, he can use the Chandra ability with full information. Yeah. 
It's a delight. And Dustin's going to try to repair the board, but things are certainly working against him. He plays Precinct Captain and Daring Skyjack. And even with the help of Spear, Courser is still a problem right now. Plus that mortar's on top of the deck. Yeah, there's a mortar's on top, and Barry has enough mana to overload it. Mortars on top, devour flesh in hand. The play here looks pretty straightforward. I would think just to overload the mortars. Yep. Especially with the devour flesh on top. Maybe before, I need to save this for a better board, but you have a backup removal spell. You can just go ahead and, and fire this one off. And Barry just looks like he's going to do just that. Mizium mortars overloaded. Takes care of both Skyjack and Precinct Captain. Dustin once again out of creatures. Swing in from Corsair, puts Dustin down to 13, and Barry ticks up, putting him down to 12. And Barry is ahead in the race now and ahead on the board. And so many of Dustin's draws just aren't very good in the face of this Chandra. I know he has a spear in play. Barry, I believe, has Golgari Charm in hand to take care of that if he's ever feeling like that's a requirement. Yeah, Dryad Militant made for Dustin Grover. And you see just... The Corsair continues to tell the bad news here. Every single card, the <laughs> Barry's next draw just continues to be kill spells. Yeah, it's even hard for him to beat lands at this point because Barry just gaining life is, is a really tough thing for Dustin. Yeah, so he's going to go ahead and devour first the Dryad Militant. Dustin's going to gain two, then look probably take two. So he stays. He goes up to 14. And now I think you might see Golgari Charm on the spear here. And Xenagos into play to make creatures. Okay. I mean, if Golgari Charm was on the spear, he probably would have Golgari Charm on the spear and then Chand used Chandra to kill the... No, I, I think that I, there's a world where I, I, I'm not a huge fan of this losing the Corsair, although Barry's so far ahead in resources, it probably doesn't matter. Um, if you're worried about raise the alarm, if you devour flesh first, if your opponent raises the alarms in response, then you don't have to worry about the spear getting activated. If your opponent doesn't sure. do anything, you can Golgari Charm it after the fact. So you can imagine a world where Dustin's hand has raised the alarm and he elects not to use it because he wants to hold off your Corsair Crucifix, and then you Golgari Charm after the fact. Yeah, so there he did knock Dustin down to nine. He did, As you mentioned, he did lost a creature to the Spear of Heliod. But with Xenagos in play, I don't think Barry particularly minds to, cares about losing creatures anymore. He's got Dustin down to nine. Dustin forced to just pass back the turn with Spear Mana up. And that's a, that's a losing fight he's going to be fighting. We know Hero's downfall was the draw for Barry. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a real clinic here. Barry with Golgari Charm left over in hand through all this. Pretty incredible. And the Satyrs put Dustin down to four, five. Chandra is going to go ahead and zero finds a land. All right. And goes and zeroes, gets a Temple of Malice. And Spear will take care of one Seder token. Remember, Barry's threatening lethal next turn. Um, if Dustin doesn't play a blocker, he has both Satyrs and then pluses Chandra for that last point. And Dustin with two Brave Elements left over in hand, can't even use them. Yeah, and that's the second time we've seen Dustin's Brave the Elements stranded. Uh, that happened game one as well. Well, Brave the Elements, you know, there there are a couple cards in Barry's deck that Brave the Elements is good against. Busy and Borders, Heroes Downfall, that kind of stuff. But Barry just had enough ways to blunt the early pressure from Dustin, and then those Brave the Elements just don't do anything. Yeah, it never seemed like Dustin had an extra mana to be casting Brave. And that will do it. Barry Smith in three games takes Dustin Groward, so he'll be on to the semifinals. And that is our, that is a quick... 40 minutes for our quarterfinal matches. Yeah, uh, you know, it, 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 there's no revelation decks in the elimination round, so 